second session, the second keynote session, uh, is shaping up to be a memorable meeting tribute to a very significant event in all of our lives. I want to start by thanking Dr. Eisen and our panelists uh, who began for start to this conference. Um, this begins a lot of uh, a funny thing happened to me on the way to this conference. Uh, a few weeks ago, a smartphone offered me an old television show to watch. And I don't know if this is happening to anybody else. The unbidden phone makes suggestions to me. I see a prospect on my screen with a little sign that watch me and just like Alice in Wonderland I slid right down the rabbit hole <laughs> and for those of us who were not previously familiar uh, with the show protagonist Jane Tennyson is the first detective chief in after having been read when they're in charge investigation dies suddenly. Murder mysteries, like religious rituals, seek to resolve humankind's troubling dilemmas. Anger, loss, hatred, heat, accident, indifference, by addressing them with our sharpest tools. Cooperation, courage, ingenuity, caring, loyalty, like a rabbi, plays the role of the master or mistress of ceremonies who restores order to a world that has gone awry. You can call that actually a midrash on the work of our colleague Rabbi Diamond, as a great supporter of women rabbis. So if any of my colleagues would like to watch the last 25 years of your life pass before your eyes, watching this show, Prime Suspect, is a, a very good way to spend an hour. Three illustrative and immediately recognizable scenes from our lives. First, once given the assignment, she steps into the squad room where 20, I call them blokes, actually. I was surprised they did that are seated desks or she comes there to announce to them that they have to release a suspect who just yesterday they celebrated having caught their beloved chief overnight has just died. She comes to the boss's office, she gives them this news and she proceeds to give them their new assignments as to how she is going to run the investigation. And I knew. <laughs> but this was not her biggest challenge. The next familiar sequence of action shows the many ways, wordless signals, and untraceable deals that characterize the all male squad room quickly begins to fall apart when a woman is to the scene. Communication breaks down, information that she needs is withheld from her, a left undone, signals go unread. The old system, because of its inward looking nature and tendency to grant approval, finds itself exposed to error. And we quickly see that the mystery was never solved at all. Just identified the body of her daughter in the morgue. And the father naturally turns to her junior as the man in the room, speaking to him as the person in charge of the investigation. And when it is corrected for him that she is in charge of the investigation, he becomes enraged. And every calm, rational, quiet effort to just go on with the investigation only results in his becoming or hysterical, explain Tennyson's gender demonstrates that the force is violent and will not take this seriously. And insisting 
and a real detective be brought forward. She continues to try to calm him down. He gets more and more upset. A junior officer, her takes her by both shoulders and says, can't you what he's going through. What's wrong with you? Why won't you stop? And he pushes her out of the room and slams the door in the face of his superior officer. And this, colleagues, was Tennyson's biggest problem and our Because the very fact of our gender, of our personhood, of our woman, stood in the way, in our case, the people who we meet in the community, we actually came there to serve. It places her and placed us in a position along the way back to hope. And so all of their feelings of loss of horror, of revulsion, had nowhere to go on to her. What have you done? Why can't spectacular, stupendous accomplishment? Because for every story of terrible interview, actors became the people whom they most, helped the most, did the most for them. I have cases and cases of these stories. And so what happened with the women the first and the second generation even now is that it wasn't only your talents but also your perseverance that allowed this new chapter in the Jewish community get written but words like I just said and rabbi to say things like that it actually didn't feel so good to be those people always and tolerate that in her winning the law of her colleagues, solving the mystery, ending things victorious. And had it not been for all of you being able and willing to go through those years and stand in the hallway, we would not have come to the place and the opportunity of so much so much change. And not only over the course of Jewish history, a few stand out when the way we worship and related to each other fundamentally change. Um, Yochanan ben Zakkai, the state of Israel, and in our own times and in our own lives, the acceptance of the Jewish community that our leaders can be men and women. And for all that accumulation of seeing only male role models, role models, time actually is on our side in this. One or two generations of women rabbis on the pulpit, graveside, under the chuppah, and respond to. That is most aptly described in the title of the children's book, Ima on the Bima. Once you're there, it changes everything. And I noticed today at lunch that, um, that a number of male colleagues were here with very small babies. <laughs> and it really started to remind me of how women, but also for men, want as much as we do to have lots who want as much as we do to pursue careers and also live a full life. For the class that will graduate in just a few weeks, it is every bit as important as it was for the class of 1985. Only 17.5% of the rabbinical assembly is women, even though most classes have had around 40% women in them after the first few years. By contrast, fully 50% members of the rabbinical assembly graduated in all male classes. So there is yet much to do and much to hope for and to understand how to accomplish a world in which Ima is on the Bima, in which 
male rabbis with them to conferences and look towards a life a new for the Jewish people. With that, I want to turn to introducing our wonderful guest. Did musical Broadway production. Also wrote one in the same single showstopper about her teenage adventure on Broadway in San Merrily We Roll Along. A Yale graduate, Abigail was a producer for Charlie Rabbi's List and has also been published in New York Magazine, Tablet, The Daily Beast, and other publications. She currently writes a column for the Forward, living every single day in our calendar and such a contribution. Uh, 18 holidays, one Jew. She has her own interview series at the JCC in Manhattan called What Everyone's Talking About. Abby lives in Manhattan with her husband and two teenage children. And Letty Cotton Pogrebin, a founding editor of Ms. Magazine, is the author of books. Most recently, her second novel, Jewish Male Seeking Soulmate, which will be published next month, as well as the 2013 guidebook, Be a Friend to a Friend, and her classic memoir, Deborah and Me, Being Female and Jewish in America. She won an Emmy Award for her work as the editorial consultant on Free to Be You and Me, Marlo Thomas's groundbreaking children's book, television special, including the New York Times, Washington Post, The Nation, and Tablet Magazine. She served two terms as president for Peace Now. She is also co-founder of a dozen or more Jewish organizations and currently serves on the boards of the Brandeis University Women. Letty lives in New York with her husband, Bert, an attorney. They have three grown children and six grandchildren. And Rabbi Konigsberg is reminding me to remind you, words were passed out, and if folks want to jot down uh, while Letty and Abby are in dialogue, and uh, we'll pass them to the uh, to the aisles. Thank you, Julie. I'm always a little embarrassed by that introduction. I mean, it's, but it's embarrassing, uh, and I would respond with humility, except I like Golda's favorite line: "Don't be humble." I'm coming to you with uh, a kvetch and a kvel. Um, you might say it's like Moses' face when he tablets and he told uh, the children of Israel, I have good news and bad. I got him down to 10. <laughs> I must confess, great to be standing here. I think I would have rather had in our panel of women rabbis. <laughs> I think we need to hear from people like Amy Albert here and then has been cited and we need to hear from graduates from this year those who are going to grad consider this the first of many conferences on women in the rabbinate uh, of in 1988 several of us in this room blue among them uh, Fran you were there we all went to Jerusalem for the first annual Jewish feminist we nomination to the Kotel, the, the Western Wall, and prayed and ag agreed on a methodology. You were there, Jackie, on a methodology of prayer that allowed everybody to feel included and and expressive. And we never got any credit in that regard. And my point, it was it's because institutionally, the uh, sponsor at that time, the American Jewish Congress, got a lot of PR out of it, and they were done. I know that Jay has a more honorable intention to focus on this issue, so I really encourage you all to make enough of a fuss that the second conference women in the rabbinate. Um, but we're invited here to talk about ourselves, our generational differences, our experiences, our, pardon the expression, Jewish journey. Let's start by uh, telling you very quickly 
know who have read not only Deborah Golden and me, uh, but my novels because I just couldn't get all this out of my system in a, in fiction. I really had to had to do it in fiction. And really uh, don't write to find out. You know, don't write be what you know. Write to find out what you know about what you know. And there was a lot I didn't know about my own no sense to me. I was very uh, Jewishly educated. My father, but he also was a Talmud scholar. He also was a Baal Kore. He knew you know, with the cantillation and no, no vowels, and he was a bar mitzvah teacher when he was in high school. I mean, he was grounded. And uh, because my father had no son. So uh, from the age of three, I was sent to Hebrew school. I went to Hebrew high school. I went to the yeshiva of Central Queen and I was among the first to be bat mitzvah in conservative Judaism in 1952. You don't have to count 75. <laughs> <laughs> um, my rabbi, uh, crown, yarmulke, <laughs> which is how I see him in my I can't see this man in blue jeans. He's always in a gown and a, a crown. Uh, S. Gershon Levy um, was associated with uh, JTS. I always knew that. And I always revered because I was an absolutely loyal listener of the address. <laughs> and I knew the address because at the end you could always send for the script of that week's Eternal Light to Broadway. <laughs> so I was a child, 3080 Broadway, and the very first time I ever came here for an event I felt the way my daughter did when she traveled to the scene where Downton Abbey is filmed. <laughs> <laughs> I said, what well, year where the eternal light was brought little girl? <laughs> so I was quite and uh, married my husband and myself at An Chesed where my was the Shamish and <laughs> an iron hand. Um, my journey, in, in very quick sort of uh, snapshots, is that my father was very much a formal Jew. Uh, he became president of our shul. He was the county commander of Jewish war veterans. He was of Queens. He was a, of all machers. Israel in my house was my son. Spent all their time at you know, meetings of organizations during the time of the Yeshuv and then after the Declaration of the States. Kind of uh, my father's side of my childhood. To keep my father at the dinner table long enough to have a little part with him. He ran out to the men's club or the neighborhood or ZOA, should pardon the expression, and it was better. Um, <laughs> Opportunity to actually lay my parsha because uh, girls at that time got Friday night, not Saturday morning. We were allowed. Uh, mine was Deborah, God's way. You know, she works in mysterious ways of t of telling me who I was meant to pay. Um, so the thing that went wrong in my childhood, quite frankly, was I lost. I was 15 years old. And at that point, I was a very was deeply rooted, put it that way, in the Jamaica Jewish Center in Queens. Big, big, big synagogue, alley, <laughs> which a lot of kids were envious of. But when my mother died, all of my training counted. Um, the first night of the Shiva, when everybody gathered, uh, my father, I'm doing this. And it's my mother. And my father said, "I know it's Asur." Well, I also knew that it was time to shul because, frankly, in 1952, it was before the tshuva that allowed conservative Jews to drive to shul. It was, but my father drove to shul blocks away. <laughs> my father was hopelessly addicted to cigarettes. He sm smoked and put out the cigarette three. Why couldn't I count in the minion if he could make those except exceptions? Me in at a time that mattered the most spiritually and emotionally. If I couldn't take advantage of the sucker of my faith at the time I needed it most, 
uh, I'd walk away. I left Judaism for 15 years. I did not belong. That's the word we all use when we say, where do you belong? I uh, was a once a year Jew all of a sudden. I only went to uh, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur and I bought it in the overflow service in synagogues all around New York. Um, but I practiced her, the heart, the beautification of Judaism, herself on setting a beautiful table. She made Esther out of celery and par and pimentos. Uh, I drew a picture of the Exodus on the dining room mirror. My mother's role in life was to make things beautiful. She, she, uh, my mother was a super. I carried that into my adult life. Um, I, I know that when you have mended while you're in it, you have to chew a thread. Um, <laughs> I know that because otherwise the ayin hara, I will come and the devil will think you're being sewn into your out and take you. <laughs> you know, that is what you should be sewn into. Um, I wasn't allowed to sleep with the moon shining in on me because the moon would all, should only shave. I got slapped across the face, menstruated. How many women had that happen? are the older ones. They don't do that anymore. Um, when I asked my mother, you know, and she said something in Yiddish, and when I asked her, you know, I'd never been hit. So I said, what did I do? What did you just say? And, and she said, I just asked God that that should be the worst pain you ever know as a woman. Of course, it didn't work. <laughs> so uh, all of that is to tell uh, during my alienation years, I, I married. I married a, a Jewish man for whom who ra was raised in a household where girls were sort of Rashi, <laughs> um, and uh, which is you know one reason why not my children to be inculcated to a patriarchal system that would devalue my daughters, and so I gave them no heed. My children with the exception of this exception here, were not bar or bat mitzvah. I will tell you that she uh, became a bat mitzvah when she was 40. She did it all on her own. I did nothing with children except to create a Jewish home. Anything to do with institutionalized Judaism, the Judaism of my father. And I had seeded, C-E-D-E, -E, seeded Judaism to men, and that uh, it was my it was my, my tradition, and I should not have uh, surrendered it. I should not have accepted the mission. I should not have accepted the gates were barred. Really, I really object to the line in which it says, the gates opened. The gates didn't open to women, as you heard. Women stormed the gates. <laughs> women for the key to that lock. Power is never given. It must be taken. And women took it. Women did it the right way. In Judaism, women did it, in my view, the right way by arguing rather than just... But when I was island and suddenly I overheard a bunch of men sitting on the beach and saying, wouldn't it be nice if we didn't have to go back to the city for uh, the high holy, day service, uh, high holy Days and we could do services on someone's back deck? I'll borrow... Uh, Machzorim from their synagogues and bring them out there and they'll all pull out of a box uh, the Cohn family yarmulke and the, you know, the Schwartz family wedding yarmulke and put it all together. We'd have yarmulkes. We, we got them to offer free sponge cake and manashev. It's a little tiny community. It was easy to get that all set up. We set up a little somebody's uh, back deck and then suddenly one of the men said, thing. I don't remember. No, I haven't been to shul once a year since my bar mitzvah. I don't know it. I don't know it. I don't know. And I raised my hand. And this was 1970. And I I'll do it. And um, <laughs> I, sort of, I, I sort of chose one hour's worth of the greatest hits, you might say, <laughs> of Rosh Hashanah. 
and we <laughs> and we mimeographed it because let me mimeographing was the state of the art at the time and we mimeographed it and we had maybe uh, you know 35 people who had signed up and I must say people came out of the woodwork our community used to be a restricted community it set it on the ferry schedule so people came out of the woodwork and said I'm Jewish can I come um, uh, I did the service and I felt I felt as if I had suddenly made myself belong to belonging um, necessity of invention for this community it would not have chosen a woman but I was the only thing at hand. Come Yom Kippur, I really am suddenly getting extremely nervous. Serious Jew, <laughs> right? To voice, never. In the beach, and I said, God, give me a sign that it's okay. I happen to be a, a feminist, and believe it or not. So uh, suddenly, on the bay, which faces the west, there is the most dazzling sunset we'd ever had. I took it as my sign, and I chanted the Kol Nidre. And from that time on, I was the um, rabbi, chanter of, a uh, uh, volunteer firefighter was the, I, he didn't know any Hebrew, but he did the English very with tones. <laughs> Larry Weber. <laughs> um, and that was my kind of reconnection to, to, Ju to Judaism. Um, I've been working my way back since 1970, but I couldn't have done it without feminism. So I left Judaism for a feminist reason, exclusion, and I came for a feminist reason to be who I was as a Jew and to express it. Um, <sighs> Jewish feminism was happening then. I didn't know it. I actually, and I was one of the founders Paula Hyman, he said I signed to her because I had heard about Ezra Nashim and scholarship and, you know, Talmud scholar. Tune into this. And, and that awakened me to what was happening. Jewish told me. And I thought, you know, how can this be? I have to, I have to plug in. I'm addicted to it. It's my fix, um, part of my life. And this year, thank God, with Abigail present, we had our 40th. I'm going to say to her, we, thank <laughs> we don't, we don't um, substitute, we add. Feminists don't substitute, we add. So we have our two usual satyrs and we have our third satyr. People are always saying, what do you mean we sweep away tradition? No, we want to add to tradition. We want to enrich, we want to embellish, we want to, we want to make it more, uh, to make it blossom. Uh, I didn't. I didn't tell you two things that mattered. Um, the first time when I said I came back to Judaism, the first time I came back to organized Judaism rather than Fire Island Judaism, and Ellen Math, and a woman president of the shul. I, 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 I couldn't believe to see this. It was so really powerful for me. Uh, cognitive dissonance was ecstasy. And the next time I had that experience, I was given an aliyah. I saw the letters, and they danced. The great old rabbis say they danced. And they glimmered, and they glimmered. I realized I was this close to an object, distant always, where it was vizos, vizos, Vizota, that was up like this, far away. And now I was looking at it, and the tears flowed. Motion is really getting, <laughs> someone raised this morning the issue of the non-egalitarian uh, um, and I think it is time to make a declaration of who we are stand for something. <laughs> Conservative Judaism is about change, about adaptation, about recognition that we are embedded in community, have a reality as Jews, 
and we attempt to respond to reality with the text. And the argument has been made, the decision has been made, why is there this little addendum? It leads itself to the Hobby Lobby mindset. Suddenly we have to tolerate who would deny us our We have to tolerate, as uh, Rabbi Hanna Thompson wrote in Lilith in 2015, I have conservative colleagues who won't call me for an aliyah because I'm a woman, an affront to my dignity. But if I say this, I risk being accused of intolerance by those who won't recognize me. She writes, one has no authority to deny. Equality must be recognized, not granted. The revolutionary premise behind the covenant and all its laws is that people. I agree with that. A couple of words about Jewish feminism, and then I'm going to turn it over to Abby. Uh, Jewish feminism was out of the conservative movement, basically, because it arose um, in the minds and hearts of educated Jews. These weren't women who said, I want to be able to eat a cheeseburger and be recognized as a Jew. They were not those kinds of women. This is, this is not right <coughs> um, to, to uh, tear down. They want simply to use the Judaism to open the doors, recognize it, and name it. I sound like Baby Snooks. Remember Baby Snooks. <laughs> or Minnie Mouse. I, I, I don't have voice our fighter rabbi had. I'm five foot when I stand next to my rabbi uh, Bronstein you know he's like six two. Ever look if I were a rabbi as authoritative as he is wonderful long talit that they keep throwing over their shoulders. <laughs> I'm during a service they go I watch men age into their dignity on the, on the, uh, in the pulpit. Women, um, I know people out in the, in the congregation in terms uh, still of hierarchy. Man over woman, woman over child, all of us over animals, that sort of thinking. Um, we don't always look the, and some women rabbis wear crochet, but to me, uh, that's not Judaism, but this generation. I can't even wear a tub because it's my father. I would feel like a That's my generation. That's not my grand. For her, a, t a tali, a woman rabbi, what else is new? Um, and finally, the issue of women and pregnancy. Any Jewish issue at all, I talked to at the cemetery, people said, are you sure you want to be exposed to this point? <laughs> you know, the woman, at, the pregnant woman somehow or other at the grave. When a woman is counseling, and in, um, sometimes it seem, it's unseemly. I, I know when I was pregnant with my a lot of people made their children look the other way. I was just too huge to explain. <laughs> <laughs> and the hormonal impact sometimes makes a woman rabbi who's pregnant cry because the hormones are, are fear bubbling and we get moved and sometimes it's not something that one can control. Um, I get tired of as a feminist it tends to be our uh, I don't want to have to ask and beg and negotiate with men for simple dignity. I certainly think in secular feminism, we're dealing with backlash fighting every single day. We have to hang on to everything we've won. You can only think in terms of uh, reproductive rights, and you know what I mean, because it's being... Oh, in Judaism, what's won has stayed won. Celebrate that. In Judaism, yes. 
in Judaism, they don't suddenly say, okay, we're going to unroll uh, you know, that uh, coordination of your accounts. Uh, so celebrate that. And I'm leaving you with a wonderful joke that I just found <laughs> today when I uh, Googled funny rabbi. I have, I, have, <coughs> I have clearly, for the occasion, the gender. The result is years old and has 30 years. <laughs> she condemns sin, but never upsets anyone. <laughs> to men, but not threatening to women. $100 a week, wears beautiful clothes, good books, writes great sermons, drives a good car, and gives generously to the poor. The per loves working with teenagers and spends all her time with seniors. <laughs> <laughs> she calls a day Asian families, visits shut-ins, and is always in her office when needed. <laughs> if your rabbi does not measure up, send this letter to six other synagogues that are tired of their rabbis. Then bundle up your rabbi and send her to the synagogue on the top of, your, of the list. <laughs> In one week, you will receive 1,642 rabbis. <laughs> a few years ago, when I was writing a cover story for New York Magazine, on the 40th anniversary of my research to history. I thought having grown up at the knee of a fairly active, unshy, pioneer mommy, that I fully understood that I knew the story. But as a reporter, I discovered I didn't know it at all. I'd never known the way in which women had been publicly and easily dismissed, attacked, pigeonholed, and sidelined until I went to the college library archive, which that are truly available today. Why was this news to me? Because I hadn't lived through it. On the contrary, my mother's generation of feminists had normalized equality and utterly when it comes to where Jewish women used in the rabbinate, the cantorate, on Jewish boards and foundations. I have the same lack of personal experience. I don't remember things being bad, exclusively male. I don't remember a time without a feminist Seder or an orange on the Seder plate or a woman in the pulpit, progress. And everyone in this room is clearly living proof that we're not where we were. Believe me that the world is incomplete. You in this room more than I catalog the imbalances and enumerate the unfinished but the fact that I, in my travels in the Jewish world, have never experienced blatant discrimination is an indication of Jewish feminism's success. Maybe this accounts for why, in the last few years, my Jewish writing has focused more on Judaism and Jewish engagement, or lack of it, than on equality in Jewish leadership and Jewish power. I've been on what you might call to self-education to make time, seeking guides like many of you to help me connect to the, the tradition to today, feeling progressively teachings by the women in this room and so many others outside it. I can't help thinking to myself, what is the Jewish establishment broken? Look at the excellence and can be hopeful than I felt in a very long time. But I can't help wondering why this energy is not being replicated and multiplied exponentially in every shul, every JCC, generation event, every foundation startup, every nonprofit, and every Jewish home. Because the reality is that for many Jews, what Judaism offers is still missing the mark, still failing to invigorate or inspire on a level that lasts. We all know it, though we can't always put our finger on why disconnect between what we all know Judaism and what the vast majority of American Jews feel or as people who didn't get 
until I did. And my through my, what should I say, neglect childhood, <laughs> so something kicked in for me um, as I grew older. I began to be by the gaps in my knowledge and mastery. Oh, also so well, you can't really make up for it that well very late. It's not in your, but I sort of began sort of flailingly to do that. Well, I took a Hebrew um, with Miri Kabovi, who was wonderful and taught us vocabulary by uh, recording the top 40, the Israeli top 40 off a of video. Um, so I was very cool when I finally went to Israel. I knew the top day it would be about 30 years old. Um, when I graduated, mom and dad sent my twin sister and I to Israel. Um, the American Jewish Congress had a tour. She thought it was going to be perfect for our, for, you know, being a, a young graduate. And we got to JFK, and it turned out still the most meaningful possible first introduction to our homeland. <laughs> As you can imagine, when I had my first, my son Benjamin, Michal Springer, who was my classmate, Thing. There was something, the bris, there was something about watching Ben come out of size, keep on his tiny head that made me actually panic or what line he was joining. And I feel that anxiety of it. started my books, which was a way of coming at this issue, but through celebrities. So I interviewed 60 early recognizable Jews who achieved a great deal. So that was the, 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 I did and wanted them to feel in Spielberg and Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Larry King and Natalie Portman and all of those folks. But the person who made the difference, the, probably the least famous, at least to my publisher, was Leon Wieseltier, who I know everyone in this room knows. <laughs> um, tough on me in the interview. And when I told him that people I had talked to kept repeating the same, it doesn't do it for me. Judaism actually just... Mm, you know, it doesn't have me very much. And so they didn't prioritize it the way they were spinning class. Maybe people didn't spin back in 2005. <laughs> but he said to me very simply, when I asked him what he Jews who, who with their Jewish identity, he said, when Jews come to me with perplexity, develop reasons for what you don't like, but get into fight. For some reason, I started studying in intensive sessions with Rabbi Jennifer Krauss, some of you may know. That's why I started all Sotsky's class, yes, and why I, eight years ago for any of that. But I do think it's proof that it's never too late to get in the game late. It's pretty obvious what happened to me. I got obvious. I believe every Jew can have the same experience. And with the old, which me great optimism. We need new, recharged communicators. The most indelible moments of my reporting this year have been the conversation, conversations with rabbis and like Sharon Brous, Michal Springer, Joy Levitt, Judith Shulovitz, Blue Greenberg, Yaffa Epstein, Sarah Hurwitz, Rachel Ain. With four holidays left, I'm hoping some of you I can still call upon. I know that Cohen is going to help me with Shavuot. Um, the honestly, of this reporting exodus, thanks God, no rabbi yet. And just ask them, tell me why I should care about it in 2014. Tell me why I last six times instead of one. These have been amazing answers. Ed Feinstein, who's here, yes, he's a man, but he was, um, <laughs> I have had, congratulations. <laughs> These women, <laughs> but these women who I'm just mentioning uh, several of, they gave our tradition to me a sense of urgency, a specific, a rigor of freshness and frankness. Their sermons and their speeches and their lives push me to think about my, my activism or laziness in repairing the world. They don't say the obvious thing, 
They don't fall back on cliches. They don't make introspection easy, but they make liturgy, history, and ritual more integral to our lives and invigorate this portfolio. If people are spiritually and spiritually challenged, I don't believe that they will stay connected. The gifts of transmission are not, to my mind, as widespread as they should be or could be. Not among men yet. That's both a frustration. There often seems to be a gap between the strength with which women leaders feel an idea and the strength with which they communicate it. I think we need to be honest about that and work to close it. It reminds me again and again how women have been socialized in their power to apologize for a point before they make it, to preface an opinion before they offer it, on emotional or vocal tone. Women were for you to dance around an argument so it's too commanding or prescriptive. I think we need to cultivate great storytellers, rousers, preachers, and poets. Speakers who spend a lot of time choosing their words and sharpening their message so that it's fresh and penetrating in a way that kicks us in the kishkas. In my experience, <clears throat> the times that our heritage has been brought alive is with bright, tight oratory. That's when I see it for Judaism. It's what happened to me that if this outlier late, more outliers can come. I will end with People ask me and my mother how Jewish door of a door was not a given, and it won't be for my teenage daughter either. And the more mothers lighting the way, the future looks extremely bright to me. Thank you. So, when are you going to forgive me? <laughs> <laughs> I forgive you. <laughs> you saw it, you heard it. We can hold the mic. Should we have. Um, we should go to questions. Question, so question that people. And we'll interact. There's no exodus. We'll interact whenever it's appropriate. Do people have. Or, or do we have cards? Or do we have. Do we have are we letting people. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. It occur to you. I yeah. Wing it. Thank you. Okay. So there's no um, filtering this. And I hope I can read it. How can we inspire and challenge Judaism? What about those who don't sell like those in my small town that into my synagogue or those on the board who won't station? You want to start with no, it? No, it's your question. This is going to be good. Um, I think it's such a great question. And, you know, Central Synagogue is an anomaly, and it's not because I'm that there's a really very, every place I go is obviously the same struggles to get people in the door and make them stay. Not beneath. <laughs> we, we do. <laughs> sure. So what I would say, you know, in conversations, but I think that's part of the beginning is to recognize boredom. I think people actually don't say the word. And even though everyone in this room thinks that's absurd because it's obviously what you live and you're charged by this daily, I think audience, first of all, have ignorance, and that's where they feel like, oh my God, hey, there's I don't know. How could I possibly begin? To barriers, honestly, I think doesn't happen very often. And to confront Tablet holidays. I was just begging for some explanation, and I don't mean teaching, and I don't mean direct drops of why we are where we are and what, just questions or moments that in some way, for those of us who don't understand coming where they're coming exactly, or frankly, are just getting a little numb by the 10th hour, you know, that let's just recognize that that happens. And it doesn't mean that people don't come to synagogue all day long, but sometimes there just isn't an honesty, I think, about where people are. And to me, that is not bells and whistles. I am not saying suddenly have TV screens and, you know, huge marching bands at all. I think for me, it's in 
the tradition. It's just figuring out how to translate that for the person who is probably like me, who's a little bit either on the cusp or a beginner. I don't know if that helps at all. I just will add a little anecdote, which is um, cousin or nephew or whatever relationship um, <laughs> who Enzo. And, and went to a, um, was in New Jersey or Pennsylvania? Yeah. <laughs> I have that, that view like the New Yorker cover of every, everything on the other side of the Hudson. <laughs> We were there and we looked at each other. We could not believe how boring these services were because we, I'm in B'nai Jeshua and she's at Central Synagogue. And you know, what was going on was a Shanda, a Shanda. There was a performing seal of a rabbi. Okay, I'm sorry. mom. Okay. I, all right, I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> but there was a rabbi who simply was being a, being a performer, put it that way. And the cantor was singing because he had a nice voice. The co congregation was not with them at all. Many people weren't even turning, and they didn't sing with them, and they, and they didn't follow the Hebrew, and clearly no one had been invited to like a, a, an introductory prayer course or anything. So it was like, no wonder they were the only, so I just support exactly what she said. This is for you. For Letty, how do you keep the energy up to keep fighting? It's tiring to first to do something to innovate for people who don't seem to. Um, what is the Talmudic thing about? Okay, I don't have to say it because you all know it. So <laughs> I'm not even going to say it. I'll just do like joke 63. That's <laughs> <laughs> not working. And see some hurts people. When I can do something about it. Out, I have something to read that will make them want to do a together a group because clearly, you know, eight of us are complaining, so that's a group. Um, it, it's not in my constitution to just uh, sit at the breakfast table and, you know, out Hobby Lobby. I have to get involved. And I have to get involved in Jewish terms in some way. And they're not going to be rewards. I remember in 19. I said to myself, you know, by 1979, equality, because we were, we were getting so we were changing corporate life, the, the packaging on toys and everything was getting more non-sexist, and we had teachers who were, you know, responsive to um, in the classroom. I thought by 1979, we're getting solved. And then Reagan never can give up. My answer to that. That's for you. Given your commitment to pregnant rabbis, shouldn't JTS offer paid leave? Shouldn't synagogues? Oh my, thank you for whoever put this. I mean, tachlitically speaking, there's a lot we can do as institutions to lead the way to change. Uh, change the way things are done that, uh, that impact not just women but whole families, then how dare we view ourselves as a light unto the world? We need so thank God for Schiffer, who, who if she gets mentioned, she's going to have to go up on, uh, <laughs> on the um, I won't mention you, but change your policies and every <laughs> Schiffer has, Schiffer has a created, has reified a policy, paid, and she's got 95. So I hope that JTS is not one of the remaining five. Um, what are your children and grandchildren Jewishly? Well, you do the children. And I'll listen to my mom. Um, my hopes for my children, I have a daughter. Um, he, my son, I'm sure that's an awful slogan. In because it's, it's very reductive, but it's actually true. Like, I want this to be something that they because it, it is as interesting and challenging and then family important as anything in their lives. Because, but I don't actually think it can be foisted upon them. And, and we're talking as if everything was smooth. I mean, I'm very close to my mother. Back to Judaism, there was so much guilt. 
and so much sort of agonizing about what we now didn't know because she didn't give it to us when she still had it all. You know, my mom is sort of underplotted. She had it to return to because she just... And so it was hard to sit at the, you know, Rosh Hashanah Eve dinner table and just feel her kind of constant disappointment with how much we did, you know, playing out of her own decisions with us. But I think that that's why sometimes people say it skips a generation because so many kids I know just feel their parents' sort of wishes and expectations. It's got, obviously, I ultimately chose it. Siblings did not. They're, they're in different places. But I just think it's important to be aware of sort of dynamic of expectation and guilt and what is actually making this thing something that is sort of twinkling in their life that they actually wouldn't want to live without. Uh, Abby hates when I say this, but it explains it. It, uh, from, it explains my emotional um, bad, and that is that my children were the casualties of my rebellion. They were, and it's a regret for the rest of my life. Um, but I can't do it, and you know I blame I blame patriarchy. <laughs> blame me. <laughs> um, sorry. Very hard to forget. Very hard because it could have been another. Early, it could have been. We would have a, a different a different picture. But in any case, I need a commercial here. For my daughter, I really her, but she is the most creative innovator Jude I've ever seen in my life, and I really, I've been to synagogues, all Judaism come to life for children the way she does. And our, uh, our Seder is a oh, you pay to come to, because kids can't wait to come to Seder. When, what's, what's our part? Them. She gives them challenges. She hides things under the plate that people have to she ha has them enact things. She gives them quizzes. We do speed Magid. We do, I mean, it's, it's the stuff that goes on at our table is more fun, more alive, more vibrant. The head of the table in his kittle. <laughs> um, the women stood beside the men. Each family, each couple did a kiddush. And the women stood there and looked up at the men who said the kiddush. The women did nothing but run in and out to the kitchen and carry in the food and take out the food and prepare the food and they koshered the house and they were, they were like invisible except for their labors. Um, our thing like that, I had had the uh, epiphanic moment that I've had unable to do that. Okay, as I am so grateful that she's your mom. Okay, this is to me, um, thousands of people have come on your journey, what has been the reaction of friends who have not accompanied you, and what can you do to engage them? Well, I took every one of those personally um, <laughs> as a rejection, um, and I can t tell you how that feels. No, I mean, honestly, um, and one is here who reads which of my friends, close friends, respond, and the, this is what I really, it's, it's more that Harry Met Sally thing I do, but I especially for your crowd to have a discipline and a rigor of research for this series. I want it so that it would be not, but for people to not be able to say you're not doing your homework. I do my homework. And all of you have written so many reams of things and there are so many videos and there's so many sermons online and there's so many, I'm, you know, that's been my way back, you know, when I conceived this series in May, I spent the summer you know, it was, it was the best possible kind of, not because they're going to write, it is time consuming to do that, but to have a taste of just how much is out there that is interesting. And so that's, I would say, but what has been incredibly gratifying is that there I am in a world of Jews, what you all know, are coming to me and saying that makes me feel very differently about that. I might actually cheer on Simchat Torah if you do that again. I will drink with you. I didn't know Jews this much. There's a lot of holidays where there's a lot of scotch, let me say. Um, so that's, that's been the joy of it, is that some, some of us less, lesser issues are, are, I think, a little richer, hopefully, for this. By your presentation as a mother and daughter.
gender issues and and obviously obviously continue as well as women rabbis and their students and question I love the audience mm, what a pleasure um, by just head on I mean the way I think we in our lives in general I mean we do it on it feels like every day maybe it's every other other day I mean we engage all the issues in our lives in a very honest and direct way and with fear of um, being stupid, you know, because there are going to be when mother or daughter, depending on who is the more Jewishly grounded, make a safe space. We have to be able to, um, there are, there's conversations along the authentic for you. I agree with Abigail. Without that emotional hook, Judaism is rote. I mean, really, it's, it's a lot. I grew up with where you would stand next to somebody and they just read. They just simply no thing going on at all. They, they were there to show up, mostly men. They were there to show up, to be page to the Very proud of that. People walking down the aisle, making sure everyone was on the right. It was a lot of that. And not very much what I saw of inspirational. Mothers and daughters and, and women rabbis and their students. There's, there should be an unashamed appeal to where's the hook? Where will you feel most authentically, deeply, know how to peel things back and once you engage the text? This shouldn't be a secret that, uh, that rabbis keep, you know, to people right away and not wait until you, you know, you know exactly uh, the differences between the Jerusalem and the Babylonian Talmud. It should be given to people right to engage the text and peel that onion together. I know we only have two minutes. So I agree with what she said, but I'm words like emotional, even though I'm talking about finding meaning. For me, and I know I've been told this, for many people, they don't start with the intellectual and then feel. But that is one recipe I don't think is enough, which is history. You feel the power of the chain. The in front of you is overwhelming. But I think sometimes, we have to admit it, people assume the female brand is a crunchier, softer, less rigorous brand of Judaism. I know that's not the case, but I do see that there's some care that has to be taken about female stereotypes and softening things and making them less authentic. I think Judaism absolutely can be authentic and, and, and play to the strength we have to celebrate come from women and but of emotion we have between our what that exactly means in terms of you know should people do first or figure things out later you know different people have different pathways so maybe we should so stay thanks you thank you all I want to thank you both so much, my great Judaism, and I actually remembered when you were speaking that my subscription that I ever bought for myself. In thank of the general public who've joined us for these open sessions and uh, to wish you a farewell. And for those of us that are ready for the rest of the for dinner, we're going to be in the dining hall.